Welcome to the Igniting Impact podcast brought to you by Public Knowledge. I'm Stacy Moss, the host of the podcast and the president of our management consulting firm. Our firm's vision is to be a catalyst for change, leaving each person, project, client, colleague, and community better than when we started. The Igniting Impact podcast is an opportunity to share with you what our clients and our partners do daily to impact our world. We wanna highlight this essential work and the work that they do for their customers and stakeholders that is changing lives despite the many daily challenges that are faced. On today's episode, we have three guests with us, Sarah, Marilia, and Michael, and they're here today to discuss the Canadian Family Enrichment Youth Mental Health e-learning course. This is a special episode and project as it's one that our learning team decided to do as part of their PK Cares program and time Our PK CARES program allows each employee to be paid for time volunteering or doing pro bono work outside of our client work. Let's start by just getting to know you all a little bit more. Why don't you each tell us a bit about yourself, uh, what you do for work, and how you got there. Michael, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, Hi, my name is Michael LeBire. Um, I'm an instructional designer for Public Knowledge, and I also direct the custom production team uh, primarily uh, responsible for developing e-learning. I arrived at my role through a series of career accidents that uh, <laughs> that, that led me into uh, into online learning. Uh, my my background's in uh, in writing. I have an MA in English, and uh, and basically I could write. And if you can write, I think you can probably be a pretty good instructional designer. And that's why I'm here. Yeah, good good connection. How long have you been with Public Knowledge and Bulletproof? Uh, seven years. Okay. And where were you before that? Uh, before that, I worked for Skillsoft um, and uh, and LearnStream. I've been in the industry for a little over 20 years. Okay, great. All right, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name's Sarah Vixie Brenton, and I am currently uh, the Executive Director at Family Enrichment and Counseling Service in Fredericton. Um, I've been working for Family Enrichment since uh, 2012. I originally started as a counselor and I still wear that hat. Um, And before that, um, I had a variety of things. I came to counseling relatively late in my career. I went back to school when I was 47 to learn to do this. And uh, it took me till I was 60 to pay off my student loans. (laughs) Yeah, some of us had to do that even though we're young. (laughs) Good. And how long have you been here with the center? I've been here, I think, 12 years, including my internship. So I started as an intern here and uh, started uh, doing part-time work and working other jobs to help pay the bills and uh, full-time at Family Enrichment for about six years now. Wonderful. Welcome. All right. Marilia. Hi, my name is Marilia Paulon. Tell you a bit about myself. I am Brazilian. And uh, my background is in law, so I used to work as a lawyer in Brazil, but didn't like it that much (laughs) and decided to go into the social work uh, route, started working with uh, managing social work and um, projects in Brazil, and then moved to Canada because my partner is Canadian, and then I ended up here. And upon moving to Canada, I decided to pursue uh, higher education here, got my master's in social work here, and um, moved to New Brunswick three years ago and started working at Family Enrichment. And I've been here since moving to New Brunswick, loving life here. That's great. I actually laugh that I'm a recovering attorney too, because I started in law and didn't like it (laughs) and ended up here, something very different. So I'm glad. You understand the struggle. I do. (laughs) I do. All right. Well, let's get to know you on a more personal level. Um, Tell us a little bit about who you are outside of work and what values drive your life and what values do you live by? Go ahead, Michael. Sure. Um, uh, outside of work, I'm a father first, um, and, uh, husband, um, those are the, the main things that drive my life. Um, uh, I basically try and be a good guy, honest, work hard, be a good dad. It's most of it right now. My kids are both teenagers, so it's, mo- it's, it's just role modeling. That's all. Yeah. You're going to have to reinvent soon if they're both teenagers. <laughs> So hard work and honesty and family, those kind of values. Yeah. Okay, great. Sarah? I am uh, pretty boring outside of here. Um, I am married and I have children and grandchildren. So that those are important to me. 
Um, I'm an avid Minnesota Twins fan, so I am currently watching all the games <laughs> that I can, and we're keeping track of how many we watch in the season. Our goal is to watch at least 100 games. Um, I love to read junk novels that I can finish. It's one, the way that I relax. Um, it takes my mind off stuff. Uh, I like to say it kicks the hamster off the wheel yeah. so that I can relax. Yeah. And what values do you live your life by? I try to be authentic and um, kind. Mm -hmm. And I try to I try to be a good listener um, and to approach uh, folks without judgment. Maria. Okay. So outside of work, I, so I'm married. I don't have kids, but I do have two dogs. Uh, one is 13. The other one is probably around 12. They're senior dogs. Um, they're a big part of my life. Um, my free time, I like to spend with them and my partner. Also uh, play video games. I'm not into reading as much, but I do like audiobooks. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy listening to that and podcasts also at home. Um, but usually video games and going on uh, bike rides or walks with my dogs. And the values that I, that I live by, I think community is a big one for me. I don't like feeling isolated. I like being part of a neighborhood or your group at work. I just like feeling just part of a group no matter where I am. Um, kindness is the one that I value a lot as well. Just being nice to people. We never know what they're struggling with, mm -hmm. what they're going through. So just being kind and empathy, just being able to at least imagine how hard life must be for other people, what they're going through and just putting yourself in their shoes just for a second in your mind. I think it's a, a big one. Yeah, that's a good skill. It brings compassion, I think, yeah. and a lot of grace and understanding. It's great. We talk about babies and fur babies at Public Knowledge, so they're they're real. They're real family. They are. <laughs> All right, Michael, why don't you tell us a bit about the project that we're here to talk about today? So we're doing an e-learning course for the family enrichment. Tell us a little bit more about it and how it how it began. Yeah, we're we are developing a youth mental health course uh, e-learning module. It began by uh, my receiving a notice from my. Uh, my son's uh, middle school, um, that you all were going to be doing a presentation uh, of the youth mental health program that that that, uh, that we're now translating into e-learning. My son, uh, before uh, before I got that email, had um, gone through a real rough path at school, and uh, and my wife and I kind of responded the wrong way to it. We we sort of knuckled down and tried to force change in him and you know a lot of a lot of criticism and scolding and punishment as opposed to what we ought to have been doing we didn't know any of that um and his behavior got increasingly bad um and he declared to uh, a friend of his on social media that he wanted to kill himself and that kid uh told her parents and the parents told the school the school did uh what they call an assist which basically means um, uh, it's a full court press approach with the school and um, counseling and parents to um, recognize the problem and try and address it. Um, and that was a real, I mean, that was a real life changer for us, obviously. It woke us up a bit and we changed our approach. When I got the email from the school saying that this youth mental health presentation was going on, I was interested because uh, we were involved. Um, and when I went to the presentation, I was surprised by the fact that there were about 30 people in attendance, maybe 25, 30 people. And did you think it was going to be more or less? The school has about 800 kids in it. Uh. Um, and knowing the statistics I know now, that's a small subset of the population that ought to have been there had they understood the gravity. Right. Um, and, uh, and my thought was presentation was excellent in the sense that it sort of, um, it talked about the uh, the indicators of, of mental health issues, suicidal uh, ideation and so on. Um, it showed, it, it had the, 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 the warning signs. It had, um, you know, the, the correct ways of responding and it had additional resources. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the list of the warning signs, what struck me is it was seven or eight points. And they were all bang on. And thinking about my kid leading up to that time, 
um, it just it just read them like a book. Yeah. And and then when I saw the the correct responses, it again you know five or six things, and we did them all dead wrong. Yeah. And so, if this this the small population, the, this the same message needs to go to a much larger population, whether they know it or not. Doing uh, doing presentations in community centers, sort of a traveling roadshow, is a hard way to reach that large population. And so it seemed that this is something I can help with. Yeah, and my team can help with. So uh, let's propose it. Yeah. And so how did it come about? Did you just give them a call, or how did it begin? Uh, my first step was to ask you, um, you and my regional uh, vice president, to see if um, you would support the program. Um, there was no objection whatsoever. In fact, there was only encouragement. Um, so then I talked to uh, Family Richmond and received an equally positive response and then took the same, basically the same message the third time to my team. Uh, my team is... There's seven of us who would be involved in this project, and um, and each of them showed, again, a great deal of support. Basically, uh, couldn't wait to work on the program, and um, and I mean, it also resulted in a lot of follow-up conversations with them. Yeah. Um, some of them in similar situations. Uh, so it was, you know, it's a good community to be in, and um, and a very supportive group. So yeah, I was really pleased with the result. It just kind of every, everybody who needed to said yes. Yeah, it's actually, um, it, when you brought it up, it, it reminded me of how much over the last three years we've dealt with suicide as a company and not necessarily employees, but employees, families and friends. And um, you know, we've so many people in our, in our small community of our company of 130 had actually dealt with it over the last two or three years and had, you know, shared a little bit about their story and how, um, wondering, you know, what could be. And actually we ended up giving money to NAMI this year for that reason, um, because of their suicide prevention. So I'm, I'm curious a little bit about the statistics. Um, you know, if there's anything that you guys could share about the warning signs or how prevalent it is or anything that the listeners could take with them as far as um, prevention or helping uh, family or friends that are going through a hard time. Would you like to take that one? You're the experts. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't know the numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Like, I do have those numbers, but I wouldn't know um, right now. I wish we had Michael's presentation also yeah. here. But um, I can talk a little bit about the warning signs. Um, mm -hmm. So just changes in behavior. Like if, for example, your kid is, your youth is someone who's usually very outgoing and is always in a big group and playing sports and very sociable, likes to be like more um, active and suddenly you notice that they, they're withdrawn. They don't call their friends anymore or when their friends ask them uh, to go somewhere, they don't want to do it. They don't want to interact with their parents anymore. They're more like in their bedroom, those sudden changes in behavior, mm -hmm. um, even just um, self-care, hygiene, if your um, youth at home stopped showering every day and it's something that they used to do without you having to ask, you know, how is their um, hygiene? How do they look? Are they wearing clean clothes? Are they wearing PJs all day when before they would wake up early, shower, get dressed and go out and do sports or interact yeah. with people? Uh, those uh, are some of the warning signs, just losing interest in things that they used to enjoy uh, before those activities. And I think the uh, parents are usually the ones that are the first ones to notice in the home. Although sometimes with busy lives, it's hard to keep track of everything, but it's usually in the home that you notice the, those mm -hmm. first signs. And friends also. Friends are usually the ones, the first ones to hear about it. When um, a teen is trying to reach out, usually they'll talk to their friends first. Yeah. Um, because sometimes it's just harder to have those conversations at home. Um, there's a lot of taboo around it, you know, stigma. So I think just paying attention to those signs, like are they isolating themselves? And if they are, how to reach out? And we can also talk about that as well. Okay. Tell us, um, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit more about family enrichment and what you guys do here? Family Enrichment has been around for 49 years. Wow. Uh, we're, we're ramping up to our 50th anniversary next February. 
And we're pretty excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, our place in the community has always been one where folks who uh, were not for profit, so um, folks who might not necessarily be able to afford the fees that private practice would charge uh, can come to us. Uh, our fees are are lower than most uh, private practices, and we also have the ability uh, through various programs. So, for example, the youth mental health program, we're getting funding uh, through the Capital Winter Club uh, from a fundraiser that they did a few years ago to be able to offer free um, counseling to youth that are attending school uh, ages 12 and up. And so we're able to offer that. Uh, because they they pay the fees for us. Uh, We also get a grant from the United Way that allows us to offer subsidies to folks who maybe don't have insurance but can't afford our full fee, so we work on a sliding scale, and we are able to pay for that through the grants that we receive, for example, through the United Way. The fees that we charge are break even, Mm -hmm. what we need to keep the doors open. And then if folks can't afford those fees, we try to figure out ways. And the Youth Mental Health Program is a a great way that we've been able to do that. So we provide counseling here. We also have um, some psychoeducational groups. Uh, Marilia uh, uh, facilitates a group for queer youth uh, that we also are involved in. Um, We offer a program uh, with funding through the Department of Social Development um, for uh, men, it used to be called anger management, but now it's uh, men who would perhaps struggle with control issues in their in their primary relationships. And we also offer a, pr- a program for women who um, deal with difficult adult relationships. So it might be with an intimate partner, it might be with um, you know a coworker, it might be a family member, but it's just how to how to deal with that imbalance of power within a relationship and working at it from from that. It sounds like a big reach in the community. Then we we do we yeah. have a large demographic. We uh, we see folks uh, ages twelve through seventies, eighties. Um, we actually have clinicians that are in their twenties, right up to some of our senior staff are in well into their seventies. Yeah. So we, we have a large demographic um, that we serve and we have a large demographic that is represented within our agency. That's great, that's really great. So tell me a little bit about who's involved in the project, Michael, um, who's helping to do the e-learning course and who's involved both on the family enrichment side and public knowledge. As far as direct involvement goes, um, I'm acting sort of like the lead instructional designer and coordinator, for lack of a better word. Uh, I have as my my lead media artist is Greg Nicholson, um, and he's supported by Greg Tyne. Steve Crassel and Bat Heath are our developers, and uh, I uh, Steve Hazard um, has been doing some reviews for us, as well as uh, Brenda Matthews as our lead quality assurance expert. We have audio recording from Voice Factory down in St. John, New Brunswick. And our lead narrator is uh, Cece Heim. I don't know where she's from. <laughs> That's good. And so what's our role? We're, we're moving it from instructor-led to e-learning? Essentially, we're moving it from instructor-led to e-learning. So um, uh, Marilia and Alyssa Boudreau did the original presentation. It, w- it's a, it was a deck. Um, and the version of it that I received was essentially the same as the one that you presented to. So, um, yeah, we're converting it to e-learning. Now, that's not to say that we're just sort of taking it and making an electronic version of it. We're, we redesigned it um, in a lot of specific ways, um, just kind of change the structure a little bit to, um, to work with the adult learning theory principles that are going to make it a more engaging course. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of challenges with producing a product like this. And, and, and one is that people don't like e-learning. Um, <laughs> and I shouldn't say that. Some people do, but so you've got to make something engaging. You're talk. You already mentioned earlier that you know parents don't have a lot of time, and um, and so we've got to keep it as short as possible. We have to make it as accessible as possible, um, and so you know we we went with the version we went with. It's going to be about a fifteen to twenty minute e learning piece. Um, it's open navigation, so parents can skip through it as fast as they want, or go back and see parts of it if they want. And yeah, and uh, it'll be available by a web link, so anybody can access it. And then we'll talk later about how we'll advertise it or promote it or what have you. And how do you guys um, intend to use it, or what's the need for the project that you're trying to fill? Is it um, access or is it reach? Like, what 
What are the goals? I think, well, um, especially since the pandemic, I think people started feeling more isolated and uh, there's been an increase in um, the number of uh, deaths by suicide. Um, and with students having to do school from home and parents working from home, I think this um, Michael's project comes as a way to um, fulfill that gap, which is something that's online, that's easily accessible, that people don't have to ask for a parent to go and access it. The parents can do it themselves. Anyone will have access to it because you usually everyone has uh, in- access to internet, if not at home, at school or a library. Uh, so I think this comes as a way to just fill those gaps that exist, just another support that sometimes people are not really aware of the services that are available um, in the city, in their community. And even when they do, sometimes the access to it is not as easy. It doesn't matter if it's a financial issue or transportation or just being able to have that communication with someone that might help you. And I think that having that online might be a, a great way to fulfill that gap. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the the point's well taken that um, you don't have to wait, right? You don't have to wait for something to be you know, given at the school or you don't have to be searching for it. It's just right there and instant access. Yeah, and, and then also it's a more empowering way to access mm-hmm. those services. I, I um, find because it's not that someone is telling you to do it. You can go in and do it on your own at your own time. And when you want to do it, it's not that they had this talk at school. And because of that, now the parents are feel yeah, um, inclined to do it is, you know, it's something that's going to be there and you can do it whenever you want. Well, and from my experience, when you're dealing with potential suicide, it's also very, um, it's timely, right? You need it very timely. You might need it right then. You can't wait. You need to know what to look for and how to handle it and what your resources are immediately. It's not something to sit on. So it's great. So um, one of our core values at PK is impact. And we've really created this podcast around it because it's really essential to what we do and it's what we um, are here for. And so for us, the definition of impact means that we approach every engagement with our energy focused on identifying the right goals, outcomes, and strategies, and that we really believe that everyone in our firm has a personal responsibility to make a positive impact on our projects and our um, in our world, really. We talk about leaving every colleague or client or any project better than when we started. So I'm curious for the three of you, um, what does impact mean personally to you? And uh, what kind of impact do you hope to leave um, or have on this world or your community? And anyone can start. (laughs) I think um, no one really knows what their potential impact is um, in any encounter that we have. And so if we're able to approach our relationships or our encounters with others uh, through a lens of kindness and openness and understanding, that might be a catalyst for someone to be able to make that change, to be able to, um, I, I guess, you know, just maybe reach out if they feel like like they can be heard. So I think just really being able to understand that, you know, as much as you can be kind um, and open and understanding to someone, I think that can be a huge impact. And I, I hope that that's something that I do um, with anybody that I encounter. That's great, Sarah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> uh, to me, impact, you know, the impact that I like to imagine that I uh, have, uh, that, that I uh, create in people's lives is just to increase their support network. I really, it gives me great joy to know that I'm part of a, someone's support system. And in the work that we do, I think that's the main thing. It's just being there for them, being able to um, provide people with an environment where they feel they are being heard without judgment. And I think that's a big part of the project as well is just not having that judgment piece that sometimes uh, um, makes it harder for people to communicate when they're having a hard time. Uh, and also making sure that people feel included in their community. You know, the we talk about it all the time, like you're not alone, but how do we make, how do we let people understand it and feel that they are not alone and mm-hmm. because people feel lonely a lot. And just talking about it's not um, enough. Yeah. And with the work that we do and this type of project, I think that we can make sure that there's 
more out there that people can find and more support that they can find that will make them feel like, yes, I, I am included in my community, I belong. Yeah, I love that. I, I recently read an article that talked about <clears throat> how loneliness is the next great epidemic or pandemic, right? Like we got through the pandemic, thankfully, and um, you know, we've we know now who can who can withstand that health condition, but now we're dealing with a whole nother social condition around just an epidemic of loneliness and the mental health issues that come out of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you look at um, other countries and other communities where people live the longest and you know you look at research that what it says is that the sense of community the sense of belonging knowing that you have a support system in your community makes a big difference people are healthier when they feel included yeah for sure and i think oh, i didn't yeah. mean to interrupt no. but i think what's really um what's really great about being part of that community is that it's such a privilege when we're sitting, like when Marilee and I are sitting with a client, it's such a privilege to have someone trust you yeah. with their information and with their story. And um, I know that I gain so much as as being part of that helping system. I gain so much myself um, that, you know, I'm empowered as well by what I what I experience and what I learn from my clients. So I think that's just a, an amazing, an, an amazing gift that yeah. um, the community offers. Yeah, that you're impacted just as much as you are impacting Absolutely. others. Yeah, that's beautiful. Michael, what about you? What does impact mean to you? And what type of impact do you hope to have on this world? In, in my day to day life, um, I, I, do, I think small. Um, and I think as long as my, my, my impact is more positive than negative, then I'm happy with that. Since I started working with public knowledge, and this isn't a plug, Stacey didn't prep me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I think the work that public knowledge does, uh, there's great opportunity for more measurable and meaningful impact in people's lives um, by virtue of... Um, a lot of the work we do with government programs to facilitate and uh, manage and direct programs so that people are directly benefiting from these government programs and so on and so forth. I'm being kind of vague on purpose, but uh, but there's a lot of opportunity for impact. And this, uh, this youth mental health course that we're making isn't a far cry from public knowledge's work anyway. No. And uh, and so I think I'm, I'm really excited about the potential impact. Yeah, no, that's why I was excited about it. I'm like, oh, feels like home, just like what we do. <laughs> okay, so what do you hope will change as a result of this course? Um, I'm hoping that uh, it will reduce the stigma associated with reaching out. Folks are not afraid to go to the doctor for anything from the neck down. Yeah. And then from the neck up, there's this 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 perception that there's something wrong with you or if you're struggling with depression that you can just happy your way out of it. You know, you can exercise your way out of, of something that's really beyond that. I think if people are able to um, pull themselves up and out, they will. And, um, you know, just hoping that we can normalize that absolutely when it's beyond what you're able to do, there's no shame in reaching out. And it just offers you uh, an open ear. It offers you the opportunity to tell your story. And, um, you know, so that's my hope is that we'll, we'll help reduce a lot of the stigma associated. Same. I don't. I don't even know if I have anything to add. I was like, yes, so reducing the stigma and just making sure that people feel okay to reach out. Yeah, I'm. I'm reacting to Michael what you said earlier about how you and your wife handled it all wrong, and I think about as a parent how often I feel like that as well. <laughs> um, but really, how we're really reacting in ways of the information that we know at the time, right? And you didn't have that data or that new information to know. So you were reacting as best as you could in the moment and how often we do that as parents and and how hard it is to deal. It's hard enough to deal with mental health of our own and our own people, but to deal with our own selves, to deal with the mental health of our children is just so much more complicated and scary, just very scary. So, um, okay, so what does success look like with this project and when are we aiming to have it launched? The, the course is really close to being done. We're, we're like at the 90th, we're at the 90% mark. Um, and I, I really need 
I need my developers now to just basically link it up and make it work. Um, it looks very good. Um, I think the I think I think the flow of it, the structure, and all that stuff is great. Um, it's we just need it linked up. Okay. And actually, we have to produce a few more. We're going to do some animated videos. That takes a little time. I've got to get some audio recorded for that. You know, if if, if it could be done in a month, but realistically, it's probably going to be more like three, four months more yeah. before it's actually done. Okay. Who's the um, Who's the video going to impact? Like, who's the intended audience? Who do you anticipate using the video with? I think everyone. Yeah. I I really hope there's all kinds of ways to to kind of get this out there and a lot of different strategies that I think we should apply. Um, but I just, I, on this, I, again, I think small. So I hope that uh, the next time that the principal sends out the, the invitation to your program, uh, they also have a link mm-hmm. that just basically takes them directly to the e-learning. You know, in terms of, in terms of the success of this project, like, again, success would be getting it done. I hope one parent takes it, learns something from it, and adjusts their behavior accordingly. And if that happens, success. Yeah. We win. Yeah. What impact do you guys hope to have? Mm. Um, I think just to be a safe, open and accessible resource. Mm-hmm. I think that that would be like uh, Michael said, if one family benefits from it, you know, if one parent um, gets to know about this and can increase communication with their youth at home, I yeah. think that that will be just amazing and the more the merrier of course yeah and i think too um because suicide um is is so tough to talk about and everybody's tiptoes around it and is afraid to be direct and this will give the opportunity to kind of say yeah if you're struggling with this i want to talk about it i want to be a safe space where you can come and tell me this is what you're thinking and i can let you know that that must feel awful Mm -hmm. it must feel awful to to think that that this is this is a solution for you these are the things that we can do but to be able to be approachable and not not be frightened because it is frightening yeah and to ask those questions because those questions those questions don't push someone towards suicide the questions that you ask just you know like on a scale of one to ten if one is i'm never going to do it and ten is i'm walking out the door and you know where are you do you have a plan, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and do you have a means to carry out that plan and all those things, because those are also risk assessments and those are the things to say, okay, so these are the things we can do in the home. Maybe we should reach out and do other things, but there's not being afraid to have those conversations and they're scary conversations, but hopefully we'll be able to give those words and some of those ideas with this project and it will help folks to just have that conversation. There are a few parts of the, the your presentation now part of our course that were really eye opening, and uh, a lot. I think the I think the very first thing you did really was you went through like a list of um, myths. Myths, yes. Yeah. About mm-hmm. about um, about suicide and how to think about it, and a lot of it like saying the word suicide, or having the ha- having the um, difficult conversation with your youth around around suicide. We w- I never would have said suicide to my son. Mm-hmm. Never. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or wouldn't say it to my daughter either. But your your program said, okay, yeah, that not only not only is it okay, you probably should. And one of the one of the parts of the course, actually it's part of the course, it's still outstanding. We have to get some audio recording for it, is um is a conversation between a parent and a, and their youth, two two conversations, um, talking about suicide. Mm-hmm. And it was really important to include in the course because for parents to hear it. To hear how you can have that conversation, how you can engage um, with your youth to, you know, break down that wall, so to speak, and just be open, have a real open conversation about it in a very straightforward manner. Something I never would have done. So I, I hope that I hope those those conversations are critical. I, I'm stalling on finishing the course. Yeah, that sounds very critical because it's not just the hey, you should talk about it, but how, and that'll give like an a path or an avenue forward of how to have that conversation. That sounds really great. I also was thinking about the stigma that you talked about earlier. And even if you're available to go to the meeting at the school, when it's sent out, there may be some stigma around attending, right? That just keeps people from going. And so if that link is provided at the same time and they're like, hey, I really want to learn about this, but I'm too fearful to go in person, at least that gives them an avenue to watch it alone and 
you know, in the comfort of their own home and not having that stigma be a barrier. So um, each quarter, our podcast has a different theme and adaptability is the theme for this quarter. And adaptability is defined as the ability to adjust to different conditions or circumstances. So I'm wondering when you think about this project and, you know, what, what you do with the schools and also, you know, potentially having this online and adaptability, what comes up? Um, what kind of emotions come up for you? Just the joy to know that we're adapting to how youth um, communicates and access services, because I think uh, parents are doing it as their uh, kids grow away, you know, yeah. teenagers. Parents had to also um, adapt to that with online school and all of that and working from home. Everybody had to kind of get used to it. Um, so I think that's just knowing that we're moving forward at the, at the same pace, mm -hmm. kind of. Just trying to provide this as an online resource at no cost. You know, there's no need to wait. You can just access uh, that resource. So I think that's um, the emotion that comes up. I think it'll be just a joy to know that this resource will be out there and that we're adapting to how youth communicates and accesses uh, services. Love that. Sarah, what about you? What emotions come up for you? Um, I don't know. I, I just think COVID taught us so much um, about adaptability. And um, prior to COVID, we thought that in order for someone to be helped, they had to come into our office and sit face to face. And we discovered very quickly that we can connect over the telephone, that we can connect over Zoom, that we can do a lot of things that we didn't even think were possible. And so that gives me hope, I guess, that we can continue to adapt as things change. And and like Maria said, the, the youth of today, especially, they communicate through technology. Yeah. And, and a lot of the face-to-face -face skills have been lost, I guess, somewhat as a result of COVID. You know, I mean, kids' social awkwardness is kind of one of the things that we all remember mm -hmm. and that, that everybody experiences from time to time. But when we've had to isolate ourselves, when we've learned to communicate via text, um, via, you know, Snapchat, and I mean, I'm old, so, you know, <laughs> I don't do these things, but, but, but I know that that's the way that youth communicate. And so we need to be able to communicate in the way that they understand. I mean, that's the role of a great communicator. It's not like I understand 100% of everything that comes out of my mouth. But if you don't understand it, if I don't communicate in a way that makes you understand what I'm saying, then I fail at my communication. Yeah. So this is the offering the opportunity, like Marilia said, to, to meet the youth where they are. I love that. Anything about this project or your uh, life as a parent, Michael, that you've had to adapt to? <laughs> yeah, as a parent, but to adapt. Yeah. To adapt to a new way of thinking. Yeah. Um, learning and, and adapting are kind of the same thing. And, and one, I don't know which one comes first. Um, so I adapted my behavior based on your presentation. Um, so, I mean, definitely uh, adapting that way. I think also um, I, I would like to, once this e-learning is done, it's being developed in a certain way um, that would be very good to look at on a desktop or on a computer. It will work on a phone, but it's not going to be ideal. It, it's not ideal. It works on a phone just fine, but it's not ideal. The, we uh, So I'm going to, planning to adapt the program to a different program so it's better, you, uh, you can use it on a smartphone a lot easier. But also going toward what you were saying there, Sarah, um, I know you also have a program on uh, on the harms of social media. Or you were doing a presentation, am I right? Uh, yes, we talked about it, but we haven't had, we didn't get to um, do the presentation yet. But yes, right after the town hall, we did discuss um, doing something related to social media and just chronically online kids. Well, if you ever, if you ever, if you, if you have the presentation or if you, whether you deliver it or not, if you have it, maybe that's your too. Yeah. So much there around social media. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think we should keep talking about it. Yeah. Right. So um, this actually leads well into one of our aspirational values is progress, right? So this is just about the collective of the impact. So if we're having impact and then more impact and then more impact, that collective is like driving us down the road to progress. Um, and so when we want each engagement, right, to build upon the last, um, how do we, how do you know, right, like that you've achieved progress and how are you learning along the way? And so I'm curious, I know that this project is a continuation of something that you did in person and now we're taking it online. 
But are there any lessons learned, right? Things that either you learned um, by having a success or having a failure from giving this presentation over time and um, things that you've learned along the way from the parents or from your own facilitation of it? That's a very good question and difficult to answer. But I'm thinking uh, one thing that I learned since that uh, town hall meeting is that um, there's not a lot of communication between maybe the school and parents and parents with other parents in the school, um, which I think contributes to uh, the stigma and not being able to be more direct because those conversations like about suicide um, or mental health issues in general, if it's not normalized, then people just with their families maybe try to talk about it, but then it's difficult. And when you open that conversation, like the town hall meeting that we had and parents uh, showed up sharing their own stories and their own struggles and their challenges with their own um, youth and some youth also, um, they were able to share their own stories there. So I think that's uh, that's something that I learned from this whole project is that there's not, there's not enough communication and just um, there's still a lot of stigma around it and we need to do more of projects like this one in order to let people make help people feel comfortable yeah. with uh, having those conversations so they know that it's not just my youth that's struggling you know uh, chances are out of uh, 10 uh, youth six or seven will be struggling with with some mental health uh, challenge you know so but if you think that it's only at your home that this is going on it'll be harder to have those conversations so I think that this is something that I learned just how important that it is and going back to impact, you know, the impact that we can have in a community um, and adapting to all of this to help people connect and share their stories. It, it's, it doesn't matter if it's at school or a support group or through an online uh, module. Yeah, and some of our other work in the child welfare field, we um, talk about peer-to-peer -peer work, right? Like parents working with parents and kids working mm -hmm. with kids who have been in the system and how powerful that like I see you and you see me and we have that same experience. It sounds like that's a very useful thing here as well. It's, I, it's certainly something, so I have facilitated the group for the, the women that have uh, dealt with difficult relationships. And the best part about the group is not anything, any information that, that I might present or, you know, another facilitator might present. It's the ability for those who had that experience to be able to go, that happened to you too. Mm -hmm. And even though intellectually we understand, so for example, domestic violence or suicide or something like that, we understand that that happens to, be, to, to folks, but when it happens to us, it feels very isolating. And to be able to have someone, even though their story might not be the same, for, for someone to say, you know, my kid called me and, and or, or told me that they were suicidal or somebody, you know, a, a parent called me, and to be able to say, that happened to me too. I was so scared, right? And to be able to normalize those feelings. And that is, I think, the most powerful thing that can happen. And so for us to be able to start those conversations and to facilitate that communication, um, I think is, is such an incredible, again, gift uh, mm -hmm. that we've been given. Well, and I think about it's probably not just the connection, but it may be building community too, back to what you said earlier, Marilia. Like if we're building that connection with that person that's been through it and then they're there as part of my support system moving forward, then that community is even stronger and really wrapping around that child too. Any lessons learned, Michael? <laughs> Successes or failures along the way? Uh, I think when we first started this project, I said we'd probably take about six months. I think we're going into a year now. A lesson learned about how quickly or my, my <laughs> overestimation skills uh, should probably be reduced a little bit. Um, you know, I, I hope that we can do modules quicker in, in, in future due to, uh, the, you know, it's just we're a busy team and um, and being able to fit this in has been a bit of a challenge. I think everybody's exhausted their um, the PK cares hours they have on it. And now we're, we're now we're just running on volunteerism. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it would be one so it's sort of a very practical lesson. Learned. Yeah. But I do like your uh, your idea of this engine sort of driving the multi points. Um, of, of impact driving forward this this message to destigmatize the conversation and so on. I think I think that's I think that's really important. And I just thought to be part of the you know moving moving things in the right direction at least. Yeah. So 
can we, um, I'm thinking about any listeners who might be parents who are actually dealing with this right now and worried about suicide with their children. Is there any advice that we can leave them with kind of how to respond or how not to respond? You know, what, what does that look like? One advice that I would give to parents is just educate yourself. Go talk to a guidance counselor at school. Go find information online, you know, educate yourself so you know that you know how to react and how to approach those conversations. You know, like this is an amazing project. There are other resources out there that might help, you know, uh, parents dealing with this. Just educate yourself. Educate yourself on the language that you're using when you're talking to your uh, youth, you know, how you approach, how you're managing yourself. Do you have the emotional capacity to have those conversations? You know, educate yourself on how to start a conversation and how to prepare for it. So you um, can be more um, certain that you, when you do have those conversations with your youth, they will feel supported instead of feeling, you know, uh, other blaming me or now I'm feeling everyone feel bad at home. So I better just pretend that everything is fine because now my parents are miserable. It's not about the parents, it's about the, the youth who's struggling. So just, again, educate yourself. And I think maybe um, cut yourself some slack. You are going to make mistakes. Yeah. We all do. And I think um, we hold ourselves to such a high standard that um, we could, we would never expect that of anyone else. So do the best you can. If if your youth comes to you and, and you had no idea that they had thoughts of suicide and they say it, and you might have a reaction, that's okay. If you acknowledge and say, wow, that took me by surprise. And, you know, I, I was worried, but here, here's the information. And, and again, it never hurts. I like what Marillion said, educate yourself. You may never need this conversation with your child. Maybe you'll need it with a neighbor's child. Maybe you'll need it with a coworker. Maybe you'll need it, you know, it's, it's always great to have that information on hand and hope you never have to use it with your child. But on the other hand, having that information, knowing kind of what you can say and, and, and those types of things, I think is, is a great thing to have in your toolbox so that you can you know push that forward to maybe uh, another parent or another youth that, that's struggling. And, and I think also um, knowing that having those conversations, it's not something that needs to be done only when you think something is happening with your youth. You know, just again, going back to the normal, normalizing these conversations, because by educating yourself, educating your kids at home, they might be able to recognize when a, a classmate is going through a tough time and how do I go after support? What's the way to go, you know, to support this person in the best way and letting them know that it's not their role to support a classmate, for example, but where to go. Go to a guidance counselor, as a teacher, a parent, just normalizing this conversation at home because hopefully your kid will never need it, but some of their friends might need it. Yeah, I love that. And that's such a, the normalizing the conversation and normalizing the language around it, I think is a big, a big hurdle, but one that would help a lot. Michael, any advice for parents? No, I, got a, <laughs> I got a course that I'm going to, that'll be available in a couple months. The professional said it best. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> okay, so we built this podcast around one of our um, main three core values, um, impact. But to close out every podcast, I have been asking our guests to share some wisdom and advice on our other two values um, with our audience. So I just have a couple final questions for you, and I'll give you some time to think about it if you'd like. Um, but our other two core values are inclusion and teamwork. And what I'm going to ask you is just your best advice for achieving high levels of those in the workplace. There's no wrong answers. We're just trying to give a little nugget of uh, guidance and help. So are you guys ready? I'm ready. All right, perfect. So we'll start with inclusion. So what is your best advice for achieving high levels of inclusion in the workplace? I think be curious and open-minded. Just uh, being like open to recognizing when you say something that, you know, it came out wrong and being open to recognizing that and learning the best way to communicate with, with your coworkers and keeping that open mind so you can always question your beliefs and things that you might think have as something that, you know, it's set in stone, but nothing is. We're always learning. 
just like uh, Sarah and I learn our work, you know, we learn for so much from our clients, you know, even though we're supposed to be, you know, the professionals in the room and we do have the training, but they have the lived experience and that's how much um, they can contribute with all their, their experience. And I think it's the same with your coworker. You never know what experience people have, what they're going through and what they can contribute. So keeping that open mind and just being curious, asking questions, just uh, being open to just learning. Great. Sarah, what about you? I think um, meeting everyone where they are mm -hmm. and just being able to, people don't have to be like me. They, they are who they are and to be able to accept that and to come from that approach and just to say, who are you? What, what's your experience? I think it's just sort of the same thing that Marilia was saying. Yeah. It's just being able to be open to to learning something new and to be open to new ideas, to be open to being able to respectfully disagree with someone. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to all agree and yeah. be inclusive. We don't have to all have the same ideas. But w what we do need to try and achieve is uh, trying to understand why you might feel the way you feel or think the way you mm -hmm. think. Even if I don't agree with you, I still, it's my job to, to figure out, you know, why, why you have those beliefs, why you have those ideas and to respect that you have, you have the right to have those. Yeah. Yeah. Different perspectives. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess, I don't know. I mean, I, it's really the same answer. We, we, we drive inclusion, um, in, in our, in our teams and our frameworks just by being curious about, um, you know, people we're talking to and, and learning from them and learning about their experiences and so on. So. Yeah, so the curiosity, I think what we're what we're saying is curiosity will create that safe space, right? For people to open up and trust and be honest and be authentic. And um, Michael, I think about you being, you trusting uh, me and other people at the firm to even just share your story <laughs> about what happened is like, I think brought a lot of comfort and curiosity with the rest of the firm because after that, other people would speak up say, hey, I had that experience too. I'm really glad we're doing this. This is really great. How do I get involved? And I think that took some bravery on your part, but it did open up our culture and to be more inclusive. That's great to hear. I, I wrote that email uh, probably three weeks before you saw it. And <laughs> I changed it and edited it a dozen times. I was scared. I was really scared. Yeah. But I, yeah, I'm really glad we got this, uh, this game together. Yeah. Okay, the next one is teamwork. So what's your best advice for achieving high levels of teamwork in the workplace? Hmm. I think teamwork, I think focus on collaboration and uh, remind yourself that just like if you're going for a walk with a group of people, the pace will be determined by the slowest person in the group, you know? And for teamwork, you need to be, no one can work just on their own. If you're working with a team, you need to make sure that everybody feels supported because if someone is falling behind, the whole team will fall uh, behind as well. So just remind yourself that in order to collaborate, you need to make sure that everybody has access to the tools that they need to develop their work in the best way possible. That was a really great visual, actually, the walking and getting the pace. Thank you. I've I'm never just, heard that before. Steal yeah, that <laughs> I might too. Yeah. Well, so now I gotta say, I can't take credit for it. I did <laughs> learn it from my partner, who uh, learned it from uh, the military. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're going for, if they're marching, is whoever is the slowest person, no, no man left behind, yeah. right? Yeah. So he, whoever is the slowest one is the one who will determine how fast you'll be walking because that also reinforces the need for support. Yeah. So if that person is moving too slow, Let's what's find going out. on? Do yeah. they have blisters? Are they well fed? You know, are they sick? And it's the same in, in any workplace. Yeah, it's just such a great visual though. I'm glad I like that. I'll steal it from the military. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, you have any advice? I just think uh, providing an opportunity for everyone to have a voice and then to have a say. Um, there's nothing worse for a team than autocratic <laughs> leadership, I think. Um, I think everybody ultimately, you know, if, if you feel like you have a say in what goes on in your team, you're going to be more invested in that and, and folks are going to learn a lot more and, and be eager to be there. I mean. We have a great team at Family Enrichment. Everybody loves to come here because we 
we respect one another, we support one another, um, and we we respect the job that each one of us does. And I think that's a really important piece. Yeah. And that engagement, right? Yeah, that engagement. Yeah. Michael, how do you create good teamwork? I guess I don't really feel like I create teamwork. Um, I, I'm, I, like I said before, I direct the custom production team. I'm not really a great leader. Um, I'm, I'm more like just one of the, one of the employees. Uh, we all, we all work together. And I mean, you know, in a project like this, uh, as the instructional designer, I'm at the head of the, I'm at the front of the project and process wise, I'm the first one to touch it. The, um, but then I pass it on and then the team, you know, the media artist makes decisions about, um, about the layouts I've done and changes them and makes them, you know, makes them better, improves them or, or will call me and say, you know, I don't think this approach is going to work. How do you feel about this approach? It's like, great. And the same when the developers get their hands on it, they're going to say, this doesn't work for certain reasons. They'll have to change the structure. They'll have to change them, you know, the graphics. They'll change them, the instructional design. And for me, each of us is contributing aspects of the aspects from our own expertise that are going to improve it. And that's kind of the way we approach our team. Like our, our team is, we're, we're a bit siloed in our, our capabilities, but, um, but we're all willing and interested in everybody else's capability improving the product, right? So um, yeah, our, our, we, we just kind of need to function as a, as a well, high functioning team, I think, in terms of everybody being interested in everybody's uh, expertise and outcome. Yeah, it's a very, very well functioning, high functioning team, and I guarantee you that not a one of them would agree with the fact that you're not a leader or that you're not a good leader. So <laughs> they're all groaning right now. I'm like, I'll say that's the definition of a great leader. Yep. Yeah. Humble. Yeah, yeah. Well, and someone who recognizes what the um, what the contribution yeah. of each person yes. is, what the strengths are, and, and is not a micromanager, and is someone who says, "Hey, you know, you went to school." A lot, uh, a lot, you know, more recently than I did. Um, what can I'm going to get you to do some yeah. research for me because I know you'll do it a lot faster than I will. Yeah, you know, and I know this is your strength, and and can you help with that? I mean, that's that's great. I, I would love to work on your team. I yeah, there's a real. I think there's a real shift culturally away from that. Like you described autocratic leadership, and I think there's a real cultural shift away from that. That seemed to be the norm. Oh, honestly, I felt up until the pandemic, and then after that. It was like leaders need to step back and let their teams do the work. Mm -hmm. I think it's been shifting for a really long time, and I think it would have shifted slower. And I think COVID just like hit the gas pedal mm -hmm. of like, oh my gosh, the old ways of leading and the old ways of running th running people are not going to work for us any longer. So mm -hmm. on high gear. All right. Well, anything else that you guys would like to share about family enrichment or this project or yourselves before we wrap it up today? I think I talked a lot, but I would just like to thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. You know, I would really enjoy and feel honored just by being part of this project. Me too, too. Thank you for everything. Thank you for course correcting a, uh, a, uh, a misdirected parent. You're very welcome. <laughs> Okay, well, I can't thank you enough, all of you, for your time today. It's a privilege to be here with you, to connect, to learn, to grow, to breathe, and to share. Until next time, this is Stacy signing off.